Okay, hello everyone. Um, uh, thanks for coming. Um, and uh, I understand, and I hope that you all, uh, well, you, th those of you who are here got in okay, because I know that Eventbrite's having some issues. So uh, thanks for navigating whatever weird thing just happened with Eventbrite. Um, I am going to start very briefly with a land acknowledgement statement, and then I'm going to introduce our guests for today um, and start going. So uh, we acknowledge this meeting we are attending is on the ancestral territories of the Tanuan tribes, including the Northern Tiwa Pueblos, the Apache and the Comanche peoples. We pay our respect to elders, both past and present, and we recognize these peoples were displaced to accommodate others in the name of progress. With humility, we recognize and respect these indigenous peoples, their histories and their ties to the land. So um, I just wanted to, uh, to do that. And now I would like to um, uh, very briefly just sort of introduce our guests who are really going to um, introduce themselves. Anna and Jeremy uh, of the University of Utah's J. Willard uh, Marriott Digital Library are here. And I'm very excited because the work they're doing with quick response projects like the Utah COVID-19 digital collection are very much like the projects a lot of you described to me about what you wanted to. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to them. So thank you, Anna and Jeremy, welcome. Great, thanks Shane. So I just clicked on the share screen button and it's saying that the host has disabled that. Can uh -oh. you go ahead and do that so we can- Sorry about that. Oh, Let's... no problem. Yep, let me- uh... The joys of Zoom. Yeah, let's see. Hold on, I always forget how to advance sharing options. There we go. Um, okay, I think you're good. I think you can do it. Okay, let's see. No, yes, okay, good. Okay, you have it there? Yes. All right, great. So thanks everybody for coming today so we can share a little bit of information about the project that we've been working on over the last year, the Utah COVID-19 Digital Collection. We're going to use this collection today just as an example of digital libraries and metadata work related to digital libraries. So during this presentation, we'll go through a little bit of an overview of what digital libraries are, including an overview of the University of Utah's digital libraries, and then jump into our Utah COVID-19 digital collection project and use that as a case study for some metadata basic information, and then give some resources for learning more that you can dive into if you are interested in this and you want to jump into this type of work for your own projects. So before we really go into that, I wanna do a quick introduction here of who's speaking. So first off, we have Anna Nee Trower, who is our interim head of digital library services. And then I am Jeremy Minty, the Interim Associate Dean for Collections and Scholarly Communication. We're both at the J. Willard Marriott Library at the University of Utah. And I guess just as a caveat to start off with, we both work in academia. We've both been working in digital collections for many years. So if we say anything, if we jump into any jargon or use some acronyms that you don't know, please go ahead and ask questions in the chat. If other things come up through the presentation, go ahead and put your questions in the chat and we'll try to, to address things as we go along here. And then if we don't get to everything during the presentation at the end, we hope to have some time for discussion and answer any other questions that you might have. So starting off here, what is a digital library? These examples here you can see in the back are just some examples of what we have in our digital library, a few representatives there. So a digital library is basically any database of online objects in some sort of digital format. These objects can be text-based, they can include images, audio, visual material, pretty much any sort of digital um, item that you can have online. These formats can also include different things like documents, photographs, slides, maps, newspapers, yearbooks, audio recordings, video recordings pretty much any digital file that could be put into a digital library. And then in digital libraries, there's also a distinction between digitized content and born digital. So with digitized, that would be like taking an old photograph from a hundred years ago, putting it on a scanner, digitizing it. 
versus born digital would be like taking out your phone, taking a photo there. That photo then would be considered born digital because it was created in a digital format. It didn't exist previously in a physical format. So that's a little bit of the difference between digitized content and born digital. Then within a digital library, there needs to be some sort of digital asset management system to manage things on the back end. These types of systems are provide a method for storing and searching, retrieving and sharing this type of digital content. With digital libraries, there are many different formats these can take. They can include different things like vendor databases or ebook databases that libraries or archives might purchase. But for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to be focusing on digital libraries that are more like a digital special collection. So a collection that might be created or curated within a library archive or museum and then made available digitally through some sort of system. So just to give a little bit of background on the University of Utah's digital library, our digital library started with a few projects almost 30 years ago in the 90s when scanners were becoming more readily accessible where we could get a few scanners, have a few projects where we would digitize some content and see what we could do with it. Over the years, our digital library program has grown quite extensively. At this point, we're at around 350 unique collections with around two and a half million items in these collections consisting of five and a half million files. So that kind of describes the Marriott Digital Library that you can see on the left there. Then on the right, the Utah Digital Newspapers Program, that's another digital library project that we support. So with UDN, we have around 8 million newspaper pages from different papers around the state of Utah, dating back through eight, to 1850 up through, what, 2019, a couple in 2020 maybe. So with these two big digital projects that we have going on, our digital archive is over 500 terabytes of data. So you can see we have quite a bit of content that we're working with in our digital library. With all of this data, the vast majority of the collections are digitized content where we have taken special collections, taken physical content and digitized that in some fashion in order to make them available online. Within the last couple of years, we've been diving in a little bit more to born digital content such as adding some current newspapers where the newspaper publishers are able to give us some PDFs of their up to date newspapers where we're able to put them into Utah digital newspapers. Or another recent digital born digital project we are working on is the Utah COVID-19 digital collection that we want to talk about in this presentation. So in addition to working on digital projects within our library and for our university, we're also working with a lot of partner institutions across the state of Utah. These other institutions outside of the Marriott Library include our other University of Utah libraries and different colleges on campus, as well as other academic libraries, public libraries, archives, museums, and historical societies around the state of Utah. Our relationships with all of these different institutions vary pretty widely depending on the needs of our partners. With some of our partners, especially the smaller ones that don't have a lot of resources themselves, we help them to do a lot of the work for their digital projects. So this could include once that archive might identify a collection, then they would contract to us to digitize the content, create some metadata, put it into our system so it can be accessible and basically just turn over the project to us so we do most of the work for them. For other institutions that might have some staff and equipment resources that they can use, they'll digitize their own content and then we only provide hosting services where we would have their content in our digital library so that they can make it available online for other people to be able to access. With all of our different institutions that we work with, we have different protocols for how they can upload or how they should create their metadata, just so we have some standards within 
the overall digital library to make sure things are semi-consistent across the board. So this could include some metadata practices such as having some shared languages that we use for different metadata fields. Anna will get into this a little bit more later in the presentation, but we want to make sure that each institution doesn't have its own standards where they create metadata that's totally different than the next institution, which can hinder how things are accessed in the digital library and make searching difficult for our users. And then this also includes creating a standard set of metadata fields that everyone should be using for their different collections, just so we can make searching a little more easy rather than having many different fields that might contain the same type of data. We try to consolidate all of that data into one field so there is some consistency across collections and institutions. So here is a screenshot of the front page of our digital library. You can find this page, Anna put the link in the chat there, collections.lib.utah.edu. So from this home page, you can see there's a few different ways where you can access the content from all of our partner institutions. So right there across the middle, we have just a basic search bar, try to make a fairly simple method to get into the collections, kind of a Google type search, where you can type any keywords in there and hit the search button, it'll pull up anything that has those terms within the metadata. You can see under that there's an advanced search link where you can search different types of metadata where you could search for words only within the title or you could search for the name of a creator that you know might have taken a photograph that we have we also include methods such as the link to browse that browse page there where you can browse the different collections based on the institution that's provided the content or the name of the collection or a topic that we've assigned to the collection, such as that list there, popular topics with architecture, labor, manuscripts. So different types of topics there, just trying to provide different methods for our users to get into the content and discover all of this. So with all of these search methods, when you do this in our digital library, not only are you searching the University of Utah's collection, but it's also searching across all of our partner institutions, which helps them to get a little bit more coverage, more people accessing their collections by everybody that's coming to the university to access our digital library. So now to give an example of a digital collection and how we create the collection and the metadata work for it, we want to take the Utah COVID-19 digital collection as a kind of case study for how these types of projects can work. So we started the, our COVID-19 project pretty close to the beginning of the pandemic when things started changing. We were looking at the calendar, the anniversary of creating our collection was April 9th. So we just hit our one year anniversary a couple of days ago. And within the last year, the collection has grown pretty considerably considering the type of content that we're searching for and what's going on in people's lives. So the purpose of this collection was to collect digital items from Utah residents to document the public's response to the pandemic, to see how people's lives have changed in the year. There's been a lot of different things that have going on that nobody has really experienced before now. So we wanted to be able to preserve this time for now as well as for future researchers who might be interested in studying what happened during 2020 and 2021. So because we are uh, um, soliciting content from people around the state, when they submit content, it's all born digital content. It's all photos they've taken with their own cameras, digital cameras or phones or things that they've created on their computer. So this entire collection is born digital. There's no scanning of historic materials. And since we are soliciting content from the public, all of the content in the collection has been submitted from community members. The collection started out with a few items from the project team, people in our library who were creating the collection, just so we could have some examples of content we're searching for. But then the majority of the collection has been submitted from people around the state. With digital collection projects like this, 
they're relatively new in the scheme of things. When you think of archives, a lot of the collections that are in an archive or a library have been collected after an event happens. But for projects like this, we are collecting during the event rather than waiting until after things have settled down or whatever. So this is a pretty new type of way of creating collections for a library or an archive. We have a quote here from the Documenting Ferguson project that's housed at the uh, Washington University in St. Louis. That project was to help them document events following the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. So that quote says, traditionally archivists collected material years following an event. This is no longer the case. Digital content and documenting current events both require information specialists to act quickly and be involved in the initial development of potential collections to ensure they are identified, described, and preserved for future retrieval. So like I said, we're kind of in, we're still in the middle of the pandemic, but we're collecting the content now rather than waiting till the end because there's a lot going on. It can be, provide some tricky things to think about while collecting during the event rather than waiting until after. At the bottom there, there's also a link to the What's New podcast, The Plague Year. That's another COVID-19 type of collection where they're collecting stories related to the pandemic. Both of those projects are interesting if you want to check them out if you're interested in this type of work and collecting during a crisis. Some of the interesting challenges that we face with this type of project is that we have to be very nimble. We have to be able to make decisions on the fly for what we really want the purpose of the collection to be. At the beginning, we had ideas for what we would solicit, what would be submitted. And we've had to make a lot of decisions along the way to say that whether or not this really does fit within the scope of the collection or if it's outside the scope. So during the pandemic, there's been a lot of other events that have happened in our history. In Salt Lake City, on the same day that the University of Utah was supposed to move to all online instruction back in March, I think it was March 18th, there was a fairly significant earthquake which rattled everybody. Nobody wanted, nobody was able to really work that day. And then for the next couple of months, there were a lot of aftershocks that were, felt like it was haunting people. And so we had to decide, okay, do we include things about the earthquake that happened during the pandemic in this collection? A couple months later, there were some pretty major windstorms that ripped through the Salt Lake Valley that knocked down a lot of large trees that were 100 years old. So we had to make decisions. This happened during the pandemic. Does that fit within our collection? And then there's also been a lot of civil unrest in the last year. There's been many protests that happened. We needed to consider, do we want to include those type of items within the collection? For some of these things, yes, we have included that because they are events that happened during this time, during the pandemic. So we wanted to be able to represent the full picture of what's going on. So for instance, we have some photos of a Black Lives Matter protest within the collection that at first you might not think that has to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, but those are events that are happening simultaneously. So we want to be able to document them kind of showing how protests during this time might like look different than protests during other times. And so with those, since the focus of the collection wasn't really the BLM movement, we wanted to keep um, protesters out of focus within these photographs, just to be able to give them some privacy, but also to show what was going on during this time. So you can see with these types of decisions, we have to be flexible and have lots of conversations as issues arise. As you're working on this type of project, there's always going to be things that happen that you never expected. So you have to be willing to make changes and make the, sure that the collection meets the needs and the goals of the project. So going back to our COVID-19 digital collection project, I just wanted to give you a quick tour of the project to show you what we've done and what we've been able to collect over the last year. So this here is a screenshot of the main web page for the project. This is the page that we created last April to as a jumping off point for the project. Within, within this web page here, there are some links to different forms where people can go in to submit their photographs 
or written stories that they've created during this time to be included in the collection. And then not represented on this web page is another form where people can submit oral histories that they have conducted related to the COVID-19 pandemic. For the oral histories, that's another thing that we had to think about and what do we really want to include in this collection. With oral histories, if people are submitting a lot of large audio or video files, that can make the collection get really big and we could run out of server space quickly with a lot of videos. So we had to make decisions on what is or isn't considered part of the COVID oral history project that we want to create. And then once users submit their content through these forms, they're just sent to our queue for review in on the back end where we review that content and then process it to prepare it for the collection. Here is a little info of some of the, of the content that we've received for the collection. On the right, you can see there's the pie chart that shows the different type of content that we've received. I think it's around 87% of the collection so far has been photographs, which we figured that might be the case because it's a lot more easy to pull out your phone, take a photograph and submit it rather than having to sit down and write a story or conduct an oral history interview. So we weren't really surprised that the photograph portion of the story has grown quite a bit more than the other, or photograph portion of the project has grown more than the stories or oral histories. Then on the left side, you can see that graph has some of the different types of content that we've been receiving. When we receive new content, we want we add subjects to these so we can have like a topical overview of what's in the collection. So you can see some of the most common topics that we've received so far are social distancing measures, signs like at stores or restaurants or on billboards or in people's yards. Supermarkets is pretty close to the top of the list there with all of the photographs we received at the beginning of the pandemic where a lot of grocery stores were running low on food and people were panic buying. Or you can see there's other things like video conferencing and telecommuting as people's lives had to change for to online school and work. And then there's masks, both people wearing them as well as sewing them. So I just want to show a few quick examples of some of this content that we received. So at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the things people experienced first was going to a store and finding empty shelves. Like Anna said there in the chat, Utah was number one in the nation for panic buying. We had a lot of people going and stocking up on toilet paper and you couldn't find toilet paper anywhere. You can see there's pictures there of canned goods or I think the one on the left is from a pharmacy area of a store. So there was a lot of panic buying and people just stocking up on things because they didn't know how long they might have to be in quarantine. Another thing that happened early on in the pandemic was with schools and work shifting online. All schools in Utah shifted to online instruction on March 16th, as well as a lot of people's jobs that went virtual at that time. So on the left, you can see a makeshift office at home in somebody's closet. Or on the right, there's two kids who are attending their school classes from their dining room table. There have been many items submitted to the collections just showing people's experiences with COVID-19. So you can see on the left there, there were some of the emotional, emotionally difficult aspects of the pandemic where there's the son at the top of the stairs wanting to share his schoolwork with his dad, but his dad is quarantined himself in the basement because he had COVID. So he didn't wanna get close to his son. So just showing how that affected families. Lately, we've started receiving photos of people getting their vaccinations. So on the right, that's a picture of my wife. She was proud of to get her vaccination and to show off her Band-Aid after getting her shot. So she wanted to have her picture included in the collection showing what it was getting vaccinated. And there's been quite a few of those types of photos showing up in the collection lately. There have also been a lot of creative or humorous ways that people have coped with the pandemic over the last year. The picture on the left with Alice and Betty wearing face masks, people were told to stay at home, be only with the people that you live with. Well, Alice lives alone, so she wanted to find a way to simulate human interaction with other people. So she took her mannequin and she submitted a series of 15 or 17 photos 
of her and her mannequin Betty simulating human, human interaction there. Or on the right, there was a mother and daughter who missed each other. They wanted to hug, so they felt that they could safely hug if they had the protection of a bed sheet between them. I don't know if that's really recommended, but that's what they chose to do at that time. There on the bottom in the middle, there was a person who wrote a song that they called the Corona Blues. And so she submitted this video of herself singing the Corona Blues along with her masks and goggles to keep herself safe throughout the pandemic. With the written stories that we've received, there's been a lot of personal accounts of people and their actual experiences with COVID or with all of the changes that are going on in their lives. On the left there, the top one, somebody submitted a story about losing their mother during the pandemic. They were able to talk about how it was hard for the family not being able to care for their mother during this time. And then how they've had to grieve her loss in not such a normal fashion, not being able to have a funeral or service for her as they would have during normal times. On the right side there is another story of an elderly couple who were self-isolating within their home. They missed their kids and grandkids. So all of their kids and grandkids showed up outside their house. They lined up along the street, six feet apart with, between families and they all sang songs to their parents and grandparents just so they could feel more included and be able to see their family in some sort of way. And then on the bottom there, there's a couple of stories that were submitted from students, one from a K through 12 student and one from a University of Utah student just showing how they were not allowed back into their classrooms last spring and the effect that that kind of thing had on them. For the oral history portion of this project, it started, I believe last May, so May 2020, with three hospitalists at University Hospital who had been dealing with COVID patients in the ER. And they were about half hour long oral history interviews, just talking about their experiences of working with COVID patients and how that's affected them and what's really been going on in hospitals. Then we've also partnered with other people at the University of Utah on oral history projects such as a public history professor who taught an oral history class and had his class focus on COVID oral histories and they conducted these oral histories and submitted to the to our collection. And then there's also been some med students who have been interviewing each other as well as their family members and submitting those to the collection. So these oral histories have been some of the most popular content that we have in the collection because it's you're able to get in there and listen to actual firsthand accounts of people and what they're going through at this time. And it's really interesting to listen to some of those. So now I'll turn it over to Anna and she can talk about some of the metadata and our workflows for processing this content. Great, thanks, Jeremy. Um, so what we'll talk about right now is what we do to build a born digital collection. And one of the most important aspects is metadata or the descriptive information that helps ensure that these items are discoverable. So here you can see um, a photo of a billboard saying, uh, is COVID-19 causing divorces um, as, a, as an ad for a local news program. Um, and we can see that we've broken down the descriptive information into common fields, such as the title of the item, the creator, the date, uh, where the photo was taken, um, subjects, description, and much more. Next slide, please. So um, for born digital items, we usually don't get super detailed metadata about items, even when the person um, submitting them is a librarian. And as a side note, um, one of the things that's really unusual about this collection is that um, the librarians, Jeremy and me and our uh, colleague, Rachel, uh, who first started working on this, we were really like the first donors to the collection um, because we wanted to signal to people the type of material that we wanted. So it's a little bit unusual that we're putting our own um, pictures and documentation of our daily lives um, in, in the collection. Um, so here's an example of a photo that I took and usually what we receive in the form is information about the creator. Um, I, this was part of a sequence of photos that I took from um, getting my first vaccine shot. 
where it was all set up so you could get your shot without even getting out of your car. It was kind of amazing. Um, and then it also has um, information um, about the copyright for the photo. Um, and for this form and what we're doing for this project is that we're um, assuming that the creator of the materials wants to retain copyright. So we're basically just seeking permission to distribute these born digital items. A lot of other organizations I think would make the choice um, to go with a Creative Commons license, um, but this is the way we went with that issue after consulting with our institution's legal counsel. We also really wanted to keep the upload process as smooth and easy as possible for people um, when they're uploading their item. Um, so this is, this is just how, where we decided to go with that issue. Um, next slide, please. So here again is um, how this photo would be broken down a little bit from um, the metadata um, where I have a title. Um, this is like the car waiting area where you have to sit in your car for 15 minutes after you get your shot um, to make sure that you don't have any reactions. Um, you can see that I've put my name in a more standardized format, putting my last name first followed by my first name. I have the date written also in a standardized format. And then I've also um, assigned Library of Congress subject headings to the item. And I have a URL for the right statement saying that I'm retaining my copyright for that item. Uh, next slide. So as we're um, working on things, as you're getting started building your own collections, I would really recommend um, sitting down and being like strategic about defining um, what your best practices are. Um, you've got some great um, archived workshops that I kind of stumbled across as I was um, looking at the New Mexico Humanities uh, website. Um, what we use at Utah is um, the Mountain West Digital Library application profile. And then we've also defined our own local library metadata dictionary that kind of feeds into that. Um, in order to um, make it really clear um, how we want to do metadata for these for any collection, not just a born digital collection. Next slide. Um, I mentioned the Mountain West Digital Library. This is a regional portal to uh, collections all across um, many Western states, not New Mexico, unfortunately, but we've got uh, Utah, Nevada, Idaho, Oregon. Uh, Wyoming, um, Hawaii, only because of BYU Hawaii, um, but, uh, but it's a great way to get um, more regional history. And having these metadata standards defined and articulated um, really helps make sure that people who are searching the centralized portal um, are getting a consistent user experience. Next slide. Um, once our items are in the Mountain West Digital Library, they're sent on to the Digital Public Library of America. And this is sort of a great thing that we're able to offer um, our smaller partners, like say the Murray City Museum. Um, their items are available through this Digital Public Library of America portal um, at a national or really like international scale um, as well. And then you can see um, items from all these different collections alongside other national level collections like from the Smithsonian or the National Archives and Records Administration. Um, so that's a little bit of value added all through the possibilities of being able to harvest your metadata. So it's all tied back to that. Uh, next slide. So I've put an example of our metadata dictionary um, which we have as kind of a little wiki on GitHub. Um, but you can see here that we're really sitting down and we're thinking even something that seems really obvious, like um, a title. Um, we have a description of what we mean by a title, um, the fact that we want to omit initial articles. So we never put the in front of anything or a, um, you know, or any of those articles that might kind of confuse the way something would um, be sorted. And then we also have examples for different types of materials, such as an oral history, a photograph, a video, um, what to do when you have a sequence of photos and they're all the same thing. What happens when you have no idea what you're looking at? Maybe you have to title something 
unidentified geological feature 04, that's not awesome, um, but sometimes you gotta do uh, what you gotta do. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the differences as we're processing these collections. Um, the big difference with um, the born digital items um, and the reason why um, this particular project is particularly time consuming um, is that as individual submitters are uploading items like one or two or three things at a time, it really requires a lot more individualized attention than items that might be packaged in a big batch for us by special collections and then reformatted. Um, we have a lot of issues with not necessarily getting high resolution files, um, especially for um, Zoom based oral histories, um, where sometimes folks will uh, turn on the options for captions to make things accessible and sometimes they won't. So we've actually had to develop a whole separate workflow um, to deal with lower resolution video files and captioning for accessibility that happens outside um, this initial process of when we're um, getting items. Um, we've needed to develop additional processing and digital preservation workflows. Um, and there are a lot of things, we're just building this collection on the fly. I'm not sure how the folks in special collections in our library are gonna create a finding aid for, the, for some of these things. Um, I'm sure it'll happen eventually. But um, as Jeremy was saying, you know, earlier, we are kind of getting, trying to do these principles of rapid collecting and not, not letting the things that we don't know um, slow us down or prevent us from moving forward when the work, um, when we do have the confidence that we can um, address some of these issues later on. Um, next slide. I wanna talk a little bit um, about controlled vocabularies, which seems like a very dry topic, but it's like totally cool. Um, so one of, the, one of the ways that you can make all of your um, objects interop interoperable and more easy, easily to be discovered alongside things um, is to like really follow um, some of these, you know, national or international best practices. So for example, um, the ISO 8601 date standard, um, which says as you're writing a date, um, go with the year followed by the month, um, followed by the day, um, describing what the type of the type of object it is, um, such as an image, um, using Library of Congress subject headings, standardized write statements, standardized statements for language. Um, these are all things that as you're um, building your own collections, um, you can take a look at some of these already defined best practices and see what would really work best um, for you. And sometimes they don't cover everything. When we started this project, there was no Library of Congress subject heading for COVID-19. So we had to use keywords in place of that for a while until um, they could get caught up with their subject headings. And then we were able to go in and rework things. So sometimes you think you're gonna have everything in place, um, but you just kind of need to be flexible and, Sometimes you're enhancing metadata later on um, as you're going, especially with these born digital collections. Next slide. So another thing that we've done um, that we find useful um, is, is thinking about faceting and additional keywords that we can use within the collection to subdivide it in different ways. So I have um, on the screen some examples of how we've, we've split out the content into different types. So we have an oral history project, we have a photograph project, and we have a story project. So people can just click those links and get all of that type of content. Um, the other thing, as we keep working with more and more um, undergraduate and graduate level classes um, and faculty who are producing oral histories as part of class assignments, um, we really wanna be sure that we can um, take a look at those and just see, oh, I'm just gonna get uh, the oral histories from history um, 7010, or I just wanna get um, you know, recollections from this health professions uh, LEAP class, which is a first year learning community. Um, so that's something that's sort of additionally important to us to showcase um, how we're connecting 
with um, our undergraduate students um, at the University of Utah. Uh, next item, please. Um, Jeremy was talking about our like hurricane level windstorm. This is a photo I took of my neighborhood after that. Um, but just to, just to um, emphasize, if you are setting up um, a project like this and you're going after um, photos that people have taken, um, at a basic level, you wanna have the information about the creator of the item, permission in some form to distribute or publish the item if you're going to put it in a collection and make it publicly accessible. What the item is about, um, this is where if, every, if you can get your folks to um, add a couple sentences of context in what they're submitting, that's great. And also the date that the item, um, like the photo um, was taken for this example. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one thing that happened that was kind of amazing is that we got a lot of uh, regional and local news coverage. So it's worth it to maybe think of, are there any reporters that you know? Um, or do you have um, some ways of developing um, a marketing plan or just even a press release to tell people about the project? So we, um, did a press release shortly after we launched the collection and it was kind of insanely successful. We were really lucky. I think that people were really at the time wanting some good news stories related to COVID-19. Um, and so this is a collage of some of the regional news coverage um, that we got and having this news coverage really, really helped us um, reach audiences that we, you know, had not even imagined um, before. And we got to experience doing Zoom interviews for um, local TV stations and things like that, um, which was a bit of a shock <laughs> um, for all of us, I think, but it was really fun to do. Uh, next slide. So I've put up um, a couple, some resources here. Um, both for work, workshops that um, you know, your community has already produced that I just encourage you to check out in terms of um, building collections, metadata best practices. I put a link to our um, submission landing page if you wanna check that out. Um, and for those of you that are building your own collections or just getting into digital libraries or metadata, um, these are two of my like favorite free publications that provide like a really solid introduction to metadata um, if you want to check those out. And I think um, that's about it for us. And we'd love to have um, a discussion with you. We've put our email addresses on the slide as well as our Twitter handles. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat or um, just go ahead and, and ask us and we'd be happy to talk with you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna jump in here from my blue basement. Um, thank you so much. It's so interesting to hear um, how you've approached this, especially considering that, you know, it's sort of history in the, making and you're collecting that and you know pivoting from all these other projects that you were doing um so it's a lot of a lot of good food for thought in terms of um what the differences are between sort of a standard model and the you know the agile free-for-all community model um i did want to ask uh you said there are three of you uh, doing this work. So are, are all three of you, I mean, does it take the work of all three of you to do this workflow from the public input? It's, it's actually in some ways a little more than three. So we, <laughs> <laughs> so we, started, <laughs> we started with um, three librarians. Um, we also have um, Michelle who's on our digital operations staff, who is um, the person that grabs the items and puts them in our metadata management system. I would not say that it is, um, it is not three full-time jobs to work on this collection, but um, at different stages, um, we've taken on different roles. So Jeremy set up the forms, got legal counsel, 
um, involved to make sure that we were not doing anything too wacky. Um, we have a whole kind of ticketing system that we use to track workflows and Jeremy set that up. Um, Rachel, the other librarian who works on this project has done a lot of the metadata for all the items along with her um, student. I've kind of taken on um, born digital oral histories as my thing. Um, so I've been working a little bit more directly with faculty um, and their classes and um, dealing with some of the um, kind of still unknown aspects of how we're, we're going to be handling those. Um, so we're, I think we're really good at working in teams and, and we're used to kind of switching on and switching off different projects. Um, but I know that there were definitely times when Rachel doing the metadata, like that was all that she was doing, you know, for several days, um, for example. And with that, it, in our situation, it's really nice because we have a lot of people within our library that are dedicated to these types of projects that we can share resources a bit and we don't have to rely on just one person or two people to do all of the work. If you're from a smaller institution, it can be a lot more challenging because where we've been able to spread the work around, what Anna mentioned, probably five or six people there. Plus we had some programmers on the back end doing some other things. So all in total, we probably had, and then our marketing people pushing out the press release and getting those kind of things scheduled. We had probably close to 15 people in our library that had their hand at some point in the project. And the project, what, a lot of it was really front loaded where getting everything up and running took a lot of work the first month or two of the pandemic. And then once we get things rolling, things run a lot smoother once we had the process worked out. Yeah, and it was actually pretty handy. Um, not that we didn't all have plenty to do when work from home orders uh, came in, but this is something that we pretty much immediately started on um, once we all were working from home. So in that case, having a born digital um, collection to work on and not having to physically be in the library scanning things, um, that also really helped us to be able to carve out the time to get this project set up and, and, and moving along. And, and I'll mention, this is not um, particularly unique what we're doing. There are tons of institutions um, in multiple states. I would guess that there's a COVID-19 project in most states, in some cases, uh, multiple ones. Um, so this is something that a lot of folks um, just in the general cultural heritage community um, started working on um, kind of all at the same time. So um, just, just to follow up with that, I mean, when you were talking about your partner institutions, you said some of them um, you know, have uh, the capacity to do their own digitization and, their, and sort of upload at the level that you guys would be doing it if you were doing the uploads, but some of them don't. So is that equivalent when you're um, you know, sort of doing the back end work for your your smaller partners as as when uh, you're doing it for just public input? Yeah, so a lot of that can vary across the board. We have some of our partners that have some resources. So we give them access to our system and we don't really hear from them unless they have a problem. They do all of the work and they have the staff and capabilities to take care of that. For other partners that we work with, there's a lot that really don't have those resources or the time to be able to be doing these types of projects. And so they'll work with us to find ways, solutions to have us help them. Maybe we're doing part of the work, they're doing part of the work, just to share the workload, just so we can make sure that their needs are being met. And then a lot of those types of projects, they're going after small grants in order to be able to help fund those types of projects. Because even though we have this system and server space to do it, the things that keep the system up and running aren't free. We have to pay for our servers, replace those every once in a while. We have to be able to pay for our programmers to be able to keep the system running. 
And then if we have students working on metadata or digitizing content, so they're able to find grants like that to be able to pay for those resources. So it's a give and take in a lot of situations where we just work out like a memorandum of understanding between us and those other institutions, just so we can partner together and be able to meet the needs of both institutions. So you all have a separate MOU that's sort of specific to each partnership? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And then for some of our larger projects, our larger partners like the Utah Department of Heritage and Arts, the State Historical Society, will have an overall MOU with them, but then they have a lot of projects that they work with us on. And so then we'll just have like a task order for each individual project, which says this is what each institution is responsible for and here's how much it'll cost, that kind of thing. That's fantastic. I have a follow-up question for that, but I wondered if anybody of uh, attendees before I jump in with that have a questions just before. Hi, Hi Eva. Yeah. I'm sorry, did I cut somebody off? Um, I do have a question and maybe uh, if you have any resources and maybe I missed this and you mentioned it regarding um, how you organize your upload system for these materials. Um, I'd love to see that if that's available in the chat. I think we have um an article that we wrote that describes it in more detail. And so I'll dig that up and put that in the chat. We're using um, JIRA, if, that, if you're familiar with that at all, um, as a workflow management system, essentially. Um, anything you have to add to that, <laughs> uh, Jeremy? <laughs> Yeah, so I just put a link in the chat to an article about, we call it our SIMP tool, which is our backend um, project management system, where we're able to upload the content into that, then it acts as our metadata management system. And that's what uploads it to the public interface, as well as our digital preservation system. I know we have a few other presentations and information about that. I'll see if I can pull some of those up as well, just for other resources and put in the chat here. Thank you very much. G, um, in, in terms of smaller partners, it, it, it seems like you're doing some custom programming work um, and, then, and then allowing others to use it. Um, do you have any smaller partner institutions or other projects that you know about that are using other types of like off the shelf software to handle the ingest metadata form and file collection <laughs> process? <laughs> or, I mean, if you're, if you're not partnering with the University of Utah, do you know of any other tools um, that might be available for this sort of digital collecting in a way that isn't all manual. I think it depends on what you want to do. I would, if, if I was at an institution um, with less resources, I would start getting really um, creative with Google Forms and spreadsheets, honestly, um, as, as a possibility. And then um, for something like this, um, a file storage uh, service like Dropbox or something like that. If I was trying to um, replicate what we do um, with, with free tools, um, something like that. And then maybe a project management um, solution like Trello where it has little cards that you can kind of progress things um, through the workflow. Um, that's what that's what I would think of um, off the top of my head. Jeremy, any other things that you can think of as well? Yeah, so I guess the way our digital library started, so back in 2001, 2002, we um, bought Content DM as our digital asset management system. We were using that system up till about so 2016, 2017, when we built our own system for displaying the content as well as the ingest on the back end. So for what's that 15, 16, 17 years, we were using content DM 
in this very way, working with our partners, having that as the method for them to be able to get in and manage their collections, to upload new content and be able to just provide that system for them to be able to do their own work. So now that we have this new system that we've developed in-house as our digital asset management system and project management system, we're able to just in a similar way give access to our partners to that system to be able to continue the same type of work. I know around the country there's a lot of other larger universities that do the same kind of thing with their smaller institutions around the state where they'll partner together to be able to uh, do the same type of work with doing the project management, doing the digitization or metadata work, and then providing solutions for hosting the content and making it available. Some states like Texas has a Texas Digital Library where they're able to have a huge number of institutions all partner together and put their items into the Texas Digital Library. So it just depends on what's available in your area. I'm not sure what maybe like University of New Mexico or others around there might be able to provide like that. Yeah, we're I'm we're uh, partners with UNM and we're still in content DM and I'm I'm finding it hard to manage information through that particular workflow with content DM, um, but but creating it in the first place, <laughs> you know, during when people offer it to you is is a ch I think a challenge that I'm I'm thinking about how to solve with the tools I have. Yeah, it's tricky for sure. So um, my question, jumping back just to follow a little bit on what um, you were talking uh, uh, on Ellen's questions a little bit as well, which is, um, uh, and, and I, I feel like you described a little bit and also I see that you put an example of pricing of how you work with partners, but it really is addressing, you know, I often say this thing, which is capacity is the elephant in the room regarding mm -hmm. everything. Can you describe a little bit what that conversation is with your when when a when a small institution comes to you with a project or you have a project they're involved in, particularly if it's like a quick response digital one like the COVID nineteen project? Like, what is the conversation about ensuring the capacity is there on their end to dress for success and make sure the project's going to happen? Like, what how, how do you guys negotiate that or or figure that out? That's a very good question. And it's something that it seems like we struggle with with every project. So everybody has their ideal world that they're thinking about with what this project will look like in the beginning. And once you get into the project, things always change. And so there has to be some sort of negotiation down the line. In our institution, when we work with other institutions that are able to fund the project through a grant or something like that, there are often times where we're able to have that money and be able to hire a couple of extra student employees within our department to be able to take on some of that workload so that we can get things done within their time frame. If the time frame is just before the end of the grant or whatever, just to make sure that we can get that done. There was something else I was going to say and it slipped my mind. Anna, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I would say making it more systematic is kind of a goal of mine. I am not quite sure how to achieve that. We, I think um, with everything, there are still some projects where things fall through the cracks. There are certainly projects where um, I ended up doing a lot of metadata work for a partner um, that I wasn't expecting to, for example. And so I think sometimes that capacity issue um, does get shunted to the librarians or staff in our department. And we, I think we tend to err on the side of going the extra mile for the partner. Um, but I feel like that's also kind of our mission to, to help um, when we can, so. Yeah, and like Anna said, the example where she had to do more metadata work for the partner than we expected, that was a situation where it was maybe a nine month project with this partner. And of course, during that nine months, the main person working at that other institution found another job and so they moved on. And so that institution lost all of their expertise on the collection. So Anna was able to step in at that point and do a lot of the metadata work that that person would have done in the perfect world, but we just had to be flexible and figure out how to continue the project and be able to meet all of the timeline and project criteria. 
Okay. So it's an ongoing dance of, with improvised steps uh, along the way. Exactly. Uh, exactly, yeah. So I have more questions, but I want to just check in with everybody because I don't want to hog the, the thing. Um, so if anybody... Nope. Okay, I wanted to follow up on a couple of thoughts. I know we're getting close to the end of time too. Um, I, I was intrigued by a couple of things that you guys said. Uh, one was um, uh, a thing that you brought up, Jeremy, which I think is really interesting, which is in the digitization of real-time things, it's hard to separate out history from all the other history, the entanglement, right? So that is an, that was a very intriguing thing I hadn't really thought that much about. Uh, and then somehow it's connected also to, and I think you were actually quoting Jeremy on this as well, which is don't let what we don't know slow us down in the process. So I guess it's a little like maybe talk a bit about more, a little bit more of your thoughts on this kind of uh, uh, difficulty of documenting or, or archiving history in real time and, 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 and the process of the, the chaos of not knowing what you don't know at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, and like you said, it's a major dance that we have to keep changing our steps every three beats there. We have, with this project, there's been a lot of content that has been submitted that maybe at first when we've looked at it, we're like, well, does that really fit within the scope of things? For the most part, we've erred on the side of, okay, if someone found this important enough to submit to the collection, then there must be some reason why that might is interesting to them. It might be useful down the road. So uh, really there's not been very many items in this collection in particular where we've said, nope, we're not going to take that. Those instances are more things where there's been problems with the file. They haven't been good enough quality where you couldn't really see what the photo was of. Maybe there was a glare on the window or something that you couldn't read a sign. Or in the case of the protests, if there were a lot of people, faces viewable in a photo, we wouldn't want to include that because we want to be able to respect people's privacy and we don't want to be archiving a photo of a group of people that might not want to be connected with a particular protest in the long term and where that's not the folk the main focus of this collection we've decided to leave out those types of things uh anna do you have any other thoughts on that um i think one one thing that's part of this uh process is to accept that you're not going to get everything that you would like um, I've especially found, especially with working with um, students who are producing oral histories, I know that there were some oral histories out there that were produced that nobody sent in. Um, so I think, but like how, how much time do we have to try to, to chase them down? Um, so I, I think we, we kind of err on the side of just being grateful for what we can get um, appreciating um, what people are able to send in, but in some cases we're really not able to be exhaustive or get everything that we know um, that happens to be out there, um, and that's and that's okay. Okay, and I'll ask one last question just because I know we're over time. But to me, this is a really important one, and it's related to what you just said. I think Anna, or at least it is in my mind, right? Can you uh, talk a little bit about? especially with this self-ingest process, because it's a thing we go over all the time. You're getting lossy JPEGs, sometimes really low quality lossy JPEGs. What is your guys' approach to knowing you're getting stuff that is not archival quality at all? And how do you reconcile including in the collection with that, with knowing, you know, like, yeah, just your process for, you know, maintaining the integrity of your collections, quality thing, but knowing you want this stuff as well. Like, what is your process for that? We don't have a good process for that yet. Okay. That's one of the real, the big problems with this, um, especially, you know, as I mentioned with the Zoom videos where we would ideally like to be getting um, everything in closed captioned and we have a whole separate workflow for putting closed captions in. Um, but it's this is this is a case of us uh, moving forward. I've had um, hosted some conversations with both our special collections and our digital preservations folks. We do have a digital preservation system, um, and I think where we can, we will um, try to archive the derivative files. 
um, but you're not going to get tips from somebody's uh, cell phone. Mm. And um, I think that's just, um, you know, uh, as, as folks that are archiving current history, there's always going to be loss and things that are not necessarily um, preserved in an ideal format. Um, but I think that goes hand in hand whenever you're dealing with digital information, honestly. There's no way that everything's going to be um, preserved the way we would want it to. Um, so I, I hope to have a better answer for you maybe in six months since right. we are still working on that. Jeremy, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, it's basically what you said there at the beginning of this project when I was talking with our digital preservation people about what we're collecting and what we want to do with this project, they were almost pulling their hair out. Ah, we can't accept these low quality JPEGs or these Zoom videos. They're not archival quality. We can't tell people that we're archiving these for the indefinite future because a JPEG isn't going to last forever. We can put it in our system and the digital preservation system will do what it can but it's kind of been a give and take on, okay, we want this type of content. We can't get it any other way at this point. So we have to deal with what we get. Okay, you know, thank you. That was very helpful. And let's check in in six months and see where we all are. Cause uh, it's comforting in some ways to know that. Yeah, I hope, I'll, I hope I'll have an awesome <laughs> answer by then. Yeah, yeah, so thank you. And so I guess we'll close things out because we said it would be an hour. I want to be sensitive to people's time unless there are any other questions really quick from uh, any other participants. Um, okay, in that case, uh, you, I, you know I'll, you'll be hearing from me because I'm gonna have more questions for you. And I'm glad that you offer to everyone else that you can answer their questions as they think of them. So thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, feel free this to get was, in touch. This was really amazing. Thank you so much for such like hardcore, like rubber meets the road information <laughs> today. So I really appreciate it and or, and we really appreciate it. So thank you so thank much. You thank you very much. Thanks for, for having us. Yeah. All righty. Um, okay. Well, bye and take care. <laughs>